Mr. Secretary General, how are you? Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, I would like to welcome all of you, and in particular, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, to this roundtable discussion on strengthening national and international preparedness for nuclear and technological emergencies. Mr. Secretary General, you have the floor. Excellencies, distinguished participants and the round table, distinguished ministers, distinguished mayors, parliamentarians, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be with you today, even briefly. Thank you for being here. I want to thank, uh, first of all, Assistant Secretary General Ms. Margareta Ballström for all her efforts in organizing this event. Last month, I visited Chernobyl to mark the 25th anniversary of the disaster. I attended this summit meeting, Kiev summit meeting, on safe and innovative use of nuclear energy. During my visit to Ukraine, I launched a five-point plan on nuclear safety. A key feature of that strategy is focusing on the new nexus between natural disasters and nuclear safety. The tragedy at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has raised questions about the future of nuclear energy and fueled public fears. Men and women around the world are asking, are we really doing well? and all what we can to safeguard the people's, world's people in the case of a nuclear accident. Recent events suggest that there are large gaps in how societies and the international system uh, think and act about breaches to nuclear safety. There is much we can learn uh, from each other. Those countries with advanced nuclear energy technology must ensure that nuclear reactors can withstand multiple hazards, various combinations of earthquake, tsunami, flood, and fire. We must also look more closely at safety standards and precautions. Are they sufficient? We must also look 
as staff training, quality assurance systems, and independent regulatory oversight. Uh, today, I encourage you to consider the most effective ways that we can strengthen our cooperation on these issues. How can we enhance coherence and knowledge sharing among national, regional, and international disaster management plans? How can we better integrate specialized knowledge with a broader preparedness and planning? How can we most effectively ensure that public messages are communicated in a credible and authoritative manner? Allow me to offer two specific ways I look for your guidance. The first, I'm convening, I'm going to convene a high-level meeting at ministerial level and above. A summit level will be welcome on September 22nd in New York at the General Assembly on nuclear safety and security. I will present a UN system-wide study on the implications of the accident at Fukushima and build on my five-point plan. This study will look closely at the emerging nexus between natural disasters and nuclear safety. I have asked Ms. Ballstrom to gather the main ideas from today's discussions and develop them as an input for that report. The September high-level meeting will build on the forthcoming IAEA conference in June in Vienna that will address measures needed to enhance nuclear safety in the wake of Fukushima. It will also provide a bridge to the second nuclear security summit meeting next year in Seoul, Korea, by addressing the link between nuclear security and nuclear safety. My second point concerns the importance of stronger partnership with the nuclear industry. This is uh, critical, both for nuclear safety and nuclear security. Nuclear technology has enormous potential to improve uh, human well-being, enhance medical services, improve agricultural production, and promote sustainable economic development. But we must develop a framework that balances the benefits with risk management strategies. I invite the relevant specialized agencies and organizations, including the IAEA, UNEP, Nuclear Energy Agency, and others, uh, to offer their collective advice on how best we may proceed. Once again, my many thanks to all of you for participating. I appreciate your strong commitment. You can count on my and United Nations full support in working together uh, to make this world safer and better world for all. Th thank you very much. Mr. Czech Secretary General, on behalf of everybody, <clears throat> I would like to thank you very much for this thought-provoking opening remarks and for your commitment to help us all to make the world safer. Since the onset of the great uh, Earth Japan earthquake, you have shown strong leadership in identifying responsibilities that all of us have uh, uh, in this regards in these days. But also what is extremely important is that you are very quickly identified opportunities that this uh, disaster present for us to think again and see what we can do together uh, to make this happen. Mr. Secretary General, thank you very much again for your being with us.
Excellencies, we have a um, very impressive panel uh, here uh, to talk about um, the issues on, on, uh, on the agenda. I would like to start first by introducing the members of the panel, uh, uh, which I will uh, do in a moment. First is to the left of me is Mr. Yuri Brazhnikov, Director of the International Cooperation Division, uh, uh, Head of the Russian uh, National Emergency Response Corps, Ministry for Civil uh, Defense Emergencies, Elimination of Consequences of Natural Disasters in Russian Federation. Uh, there is also um, Mr. Lorraine Michel, Director General uh, for Risk Reduction, Ministry of Ecology, Sustainable Development, Transport and Housing of France. We have also uh, with us Ambassador Tibor Toth, Executive Secretary of the Preparatory Commission Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Uh, we have uh, with us also Ambassador uh, Suganuma, who is a Deputy Permanent Representative of Japan, Chief of Consulate of Japan in Geneva. Um, Mr. Love, Assistant from the World Meteorological Organization, uh, here with us uh, also. Ms. Elena Buglova, Acting uh, Center Head, Incident and Emergency Center, International um, Atomic Energy Agency. We have uh, Dr. Maria Neira, Director, Public Health and Environment, World Health Organization. And of course, everybody knows Margareta Wallström, who is Assistant Secretary General for uh, Risk Reduction and who is accompanying the Secretary General and who is with us. We are very grateful for that. As you can see, such an extensive experience and high-level commitment in the panel would allow us to benefit from different experiences gained by countries and organizations in order to identify gaps. This also will help explore what knowledge is available to support national and international preparedness planning and how best the United Nations can support governments. I would like to say, uh, to remind you also, that on the, uh, March 11th uh, this year, Japan was hit by three different emergencies simultaneously. One of them was the strongest earthquake on record, a devastating tsunami, and nuclear emergency at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. These three emergencies have different causes, different impacts on life and environment, and different socioeconomic and political aspects associated with them. They have, however, one thing in common, that human lives have been lost and human, uh, or human lives have changed dramatically for a long period of time. Following the devastation nuclear accident in Chernobyl back in 1986, I visited more than once the affected areas in Belarus and Ukraine, including the nuclear reactors and uh, Chernobyl nuclear power uh, plant itself. The collective need to invest as much as we can in preparedness for this type of technological incidents is more than self-evident. It is an absolute must. And it was uh, again confirmed during the discussion that we had just before that on preparedness in general. Before giving the floor to panel members, let me remind all of us what Secretary General has asked us to do, that is to prepare for the discussions that take place later this year and next year on how we can work together to reduce the impact of nuclear disasters. You might recall that following the first news on earthquake in Japan, a raging fire uh, at an oil refinery initially dominated the headlines. Images of the inferno rising from the facility were beamed around the world. On any other day, this fire would have been a major catastrophe for any country raising concerns about environmental pollution, the health of local population, and facility safety. Understandably, this, emergency, this technological emergency vanished from the headlines as the scope of nuclear emergency started to emerge. In this context, that I can see three broader underlying issues related to preparedness and technological emergencies. The international community has a responsibility to collectively address uh, these issues. Not one single organization or country will be able to do this on its own. I would just quickly list these three issues. First, proliferation of singular or thematically focused response system, such as nuclear, develop, uh, nuclear emergencies, has developed over the years. Each type of technological accident started to require its own response system. There is a need to consolidate these uh, response systems to make sure that we'll have a more comprehensive approach to the requirements. Secondly, environmental risks and hazards stemming from industrial facilities, such as nuclear power stations, could be better integrated into continuous planning and preparedness activities. This applies also to non-nuclear industrial facilities as well. Hazard identification only focuses on natural disasters and very often uh, national authorities as well as international organizations forget about the death, uh, threats or dangers that are in the industrial development. And the last thing is the timely and accurate uh, information, informative messages. 
We know that uh, General Assembly in its resolution 46182 required that information is shared immediately. There are certain um, conventions that were signed after the Chernobyl disaster about the same thing. However, they are not implemented properly. Uh, and at the time when uh, information travels instantaneously, we have to focus on that. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. Brazhnikov of the Russian uh, Ministry for Civil Defense, uh, Emergencies, and the Elimination of Consequences of Natural Disasters to share with us his views. You have the floor, sir. Благодарю вас, господин председатель, уважаемые дамы и господа. Тема наращивания готовности к радиационным катастрофам чрезвычайно актуальна сегодня. Она своевременно поднята генеральным секретарем, фактически является развитием и продолжением практических шагов о которых с большой ответственностью и открыто говорили руководители ООН, Евросоюза в Нью-Йорке, в Брюсселе, особенно в Киеве, Минске и Москве. Основа привлечения инвестиций, которые позволят обеспечить и развитие необходимой нам отрасли и, конечно, защиту территорий и населения в случае аварий. Профессиональный долг чрезвычайных служб и учреждений гражданской защиты, прежде всего стран лидеров, наращивать готовность совместных действий к преодолению радиационных катастроф. Для России чернобыльские и постчернобыльские проблемы – ежедневные и обширные меры на всех уровнях уменьшения опасности подобных бедствий – от науки, промышленности и строительства до деятельности чрезвычайных служб и гражда... служб гражданской защиты. Уроки и выводы из аварий на объектах ядерно-топливного цикла – исходная позиция для принятия решений на национальном и глобальном уровнях. Сегодня мы все свидетели и участники реагирования на разрушение цунами и землетрясением комплекса АЭС в Фукусиме. Это еще один сигнал для наших действий по повышению готовности. Но история радиационных катастроф – это 26 ядерных аварий и инцидентов, которые могли стать и иметь уровень 7 баллов опасности. От Уинскейла 10 октября 1957 года до Чернобыля и от Тримайл-Айленда 2 июня 1957 года. 986 года до Фокусимы. Этот ряд и материалы, которые получены по итогам всех этих событий, обеспечивают основы глобальной готовности к радиационным катастрофам, которые нас, к сожалению, могут ждать впереди. Хотел бы еще раз поблагодарить за возможность участвовать в этом мероприятии и также сказать, что вся, вся сумма резонансных чрезвычайных ситуаций различных типов, от радиационных и химических аварий до пожаров, землетрясений, наводнений и других природных бедствий, которые, как мы уже видели в, на примере Фукусимы, могут привести к комплексным бедствиям с труднопредсказуемыми последствиями, все это приводит нас к твердому выводу о необходимости создания многостороннего механизма по преодолению техногенных и природных катастроф. Этот механизм должен иметь, по нашему убеждению, высокую степень интеграции 
возможностей высокотехнологичного реагирования на самые первые проявления любых катастроф и особенно радиационных. Гигантская работа по предупреждению ликвидации и посткризисного восстановления, которая проводится под руководством Организации Объединенных Наций, должна быть дополнена чрезвычайными международными мерами по реагированию на всех уровнях – национальном, региональном и глобальном. Спасибо. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо большое за контрибуцию, мистер Бражников. Я бы хотел дать слово мистеру Лоран Мишель, и также напомню, что это 5 минут для презентации, и тогда мы открываем слово для выступлений от слова. У вас есть слово, мистер Мишель. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, et en, en totale complémentarité avec ce qui précède, je, je souhaite dire qu'il est effectivement extrêmement important euh, de tirer le retour d'expérience euh, des récentes catastrophes, même si elles ont été d'une ampleur naturelle exceptionnelle. Elles, nous, elles posent question, et pour la, la France qui pense qu'il y a un potentiel important pour l'énergie nucléaire, nous souhaitons contribuer à la réflexion pour améliorer la sûreté nucléaire, à la fois sur la prévention des accidents, mais aussi sur la gestion de leurs conséquences, en considérant que ces deux éléments sont, sont intimement liés. Sans passer trop de temps sur la prévention, euh, il me semble quand même que des, des pistes doivent être abordées en commun par l'ensemble de la communauté internationale, que ce soit pour les centrales nucléaires ou les autres installations existantes, avec ce que certains appellent les tests de résistance, à la fois pour la prévention des accidents, mais aussi le test de savoir comment elles feraient face à des accidents de toutes sortes, de toute origine, comme des accidents naturels, à des accidents exceptionnels. Mais c'est aussi pour le futur, pour les nouveaux réacteurs, promouvoir les plus hauts niveaux de sécurité par une coordination, un rapprochement des processus d'autorisation, de contrôle et d'inspection, en développant une coopération internationale pour renforcer les échanges d'expérience, la disponibilité de moyens scientifiques et techniques, la coopération, par exemple, comme la revue entre les pairs. Sur ce qui relève de la gestion accidentelle, comme il a été dit par l'orateur précédent, il est important de pouvoir agir vite et de manière adéquate dès le début, que ce soit pour la sauvegarde des fonctions de sûreté de l'installation ou pour la protection des opérateurs, des populations qui sont proches. Et l'accident de Fukushima nous montre, si besoin était, l'ampleur des questions auxquelles, pour les accidents nucléaires, mais aussi technologiques, nous, nous devons faire face, des questions qui sont très multidisciplinaires, qui peuvent être à plusieurs niveaux géographiques, et aussi, je pense, des gestions de crise qui durent, qui peuvent durer euh, plusieurs semaines, voire euh, bien au-delà, plus, plusieurs mois. Alors, quelques, peut-être, pistes, que nous, nous, quelques réflexions qui nous semblent importantes de développer dans la communauté internationale, D'abord sur la nécessité d'améliorer les échanges d'informations et d'harmoniser les pratiques de gestion de crise, par exemple en encourageant des initiatives régionales pour rapprocher les modes de gestion des situations d'urgence, en menant conjointement des exercices périodiques régionaux avec des observateurs d'autres pays, en associant aussi les populations acteurs fondamentaux de leur sûreté, en développant la formation des personnels en charge de la gestion de crise, opérateurs, autorités de sûreté, experts, euh, agences de, de divers domaines. Il, il doit pouvoir aussi y avoir probablement une réflexion sur le renforcement de nos capacités d'assistance mutuelle pour faire face à des situations d'accidents graves. Est-il utile d'avoir dans des conventions internationales ou régionales des mises à disposition de matériel utile à la gestion de crise sur une installation nucléaire Peut-on renforcer et étendre les réseaux dans la durée, euh, les réseaux d'assistance mutuelle euh, Peut-on aussi avoir des accords bilatéraux ou multilatéraux pour mettre en œuvre de manière efficace, rapidement, une coopération technique en cas d'urgence nucléaire Une question qui peut se poser aussi pour chaque réacteur nucléaire, c'est la disponibilité de moyens de secours en dehors des sites qui pourraient être soit gérés par l'exploitant lui-même, soit mutualisés avec d'autres exploitants pour pouvoir intervenir et éventuellement même ces forces d'intervention pourraient être mutualisées au niveau régional dans le cadre de, de protocoles. 
Enfin, il est, il est important pour alimenter nos, nos politiques que ces mécanismes d'analyse et d'exploitation du retour d'expérience en matière de sûreté nucléaire, y compris à la suite d'un accident grave, puissent être consolidés. Il y a en particulier le système IRS, Incident Reporting System de l'AIEA à l'échelle internationale, qui est, est, est important. Et, et donc, dans, dans la période actuelle, il est vraiment important d'organiser la coopération au niveau international pour établir le retour d'expérience pour le secteur nucléaire, mais aussi pour, pour d'autres domaines. Et nous souhaitons et évidemment, dans le cadre de la préparation de la conférence de l'AIEA de juin, puis de la réunion des Nations Unies qu'a annoncé le secrétaire général, euh, y contribuer euh, euh, en liaison avec tous les pays concernés et intéressés dans cette optique vraiment d'une amélioration continue. Merci beaucoup. Merci, M. Michel, pour votre intervention. Nous sommes très récompensés pour votre bien parmi nous. Merci encore. Uh, now, uh, please allow me to give the floor to Ambassador Sagonama of Japan. Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Kalikov, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, the, to speak to this uh, global platform uh, for disaster reduction. Um, I, I also wish to express our great appreciation for the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's initiative to promote internationally the highest standard of complex emergency preparedness. Um, Japan also considers that uh, it is vital to strengthen preparedness to respond to technological emergencies that can occur as a result of natural disasters. And, and of course, the nuclear accident is one of them uh, very importantly uh, had, that has affected uh, uh, the, uh, Japan recently. Uh, let me try to um, explain a little bit what is uh, happening uh, currently. Of course, this is not a, a technical um, uh, panel, so I will briefly uh, overview the, the situation. And as you know, uh, at the aftermath of the earthquake, Quake of magnitude 9.0, which struck Japan on March 11, uh, an enormous uh, tsunami has uh, damaged the cooling system of the uh, nuclear uh, plant of Fukushima Daiichi, although the uh, nuclear reactor itself has shut down automatically uh, uh, based on the, the earthquake uh, sensor that has uh, reacted. Uh, accordingly. I should also like to mention here that uh, over 140 countries and more than 40 international organizations have expressed their willingness to provide Japan with assistance and have come to, to rescue uh, and uh, we are really uh, grateful. We sh should uh, uh, express uh, our uh, deepest and sincere uh, gratitude for the uh, solidarity that, that has been shown. Um, indeed, the uh, multiple disaster uh, of earthquake, uh, tsunami, and the nuclear incident is uh, a challenge, the biggest challenge, I would say, that we are facing since the Second World War. Uh, but uh, with this assistance and uh, the e efforts that the, is being conducted now with the local authority, the municipality, the civil society. Uh, we are certain that we will be able to overcome uh, this challenge. Um, the accident of the Fukushima nuclear power station reminded us of the importance of the nuclear safety, uh, once again, as has been mentioned by uh, my previous speakers and, and the Secretary General indeed. Uh, we deeply regret that the incident happened and we take it uh, uh, very seriously and currently uh, the government is making uh, all out effort to try to resolve the problem with a view to bringing the situation under stable control at the earliest possible date. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, we give importance to the safety and health 
of all citizens, in particular those citizens in the vicinity of the nuclear power stations and also the workers that are trying to cope with the situation in the plant itself. And we are also at the same time stri striving to prevent further diffusion of radioactive substance. Uh, on April uh, 17, upon instruction of the government, uh, the utility uh, called TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has released the roadmap towards restoration from the accident at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear uh, power stations. Uh, and in that mo roadmap, the TEPCO sets two steps as, as target. And the step one is uh, to have the decline of the radiation dose uh, steadily. And uh, that is already uh, in, in progress. The radiation has been in decline. Uh, and uh, it is expected that this uh, uh, phase will take uh, about three months. So we are uh, now already uh, uh, one month, um, two months from the, the original um, earthquake and uh, about a month uh, from this, the, the, the roadmap was uh, established. So uh, probably in within two months, we will have the uh, radiation uh, as low, uh, much lower, which will facilitate the works uh, within the uh, plant itself. Um, the step two is the release uh, to put under control the release of radioactive materials and uh, to, to have the radiation dose significantly held down, which is to have the, uh, the, the cooling system and fil filtering system of radioactive uh, water uh, in place uh, that will uh, hopefully totally stabilize the, the reactor uh, phase. Uh, and uh, as, as government, uh, we are uh, in the emergency response phase and uh, along with the progress with the works in the TEPCO, uh, we are going to shift, uh, hopefully, to the stabilization action phase. Uh, and uh, not only this type of nuclear accident, but um, damages caused to public facilities and infrastructure by natural dis disaster, not to mention the enormous Disruption to people's daily life and economy uh, can impede the reconstruction and recovery efforts. And this has been very clearly demonstrated for uh, trying to tackle the uh, nuclear incidents too. So therefore, it is essential that we also discuss uh, the need to um, address uh, the multiple disaster and also to emphasize uh, that secondary damage, uh, to, to think a way to, to keep the minimum, the secondary damage. Uh, and we also have to consider how to combine the physical uh, reaction uh, together with the so-called soft reaction or preparedness uh, measures uh, like uh, drills uh, or prevention uh, of, of earthquake education, etc., uh, during this uh, non-disaster period. Uh, this is uh, indeed one of the elements that has been mentioned already in the Hyogo framework, and we would like to uh, underline the importance of this aspect. Um, it is also very important that uh, to provide accurate and objective information uh, to the public in order to uh, cope with the anxiety and, and the panic that may uh, happen after the, uh, such uh, a disaster. And regarding the accident in Japan, uh, the government has been continuing its effort to provide the latest information uh, every day 
through various channels, such as notification to IAEA, uh, also uh, briefing to diplomatic corps in, in Tokyo, uh, dissemination of information through uh, TV, media, uh, and also uh, our embassies abroad uh, to the international community. Um, in addition, uh, with regard to the issuance of travel restriction, uh, international institutions uh, have been uh, cooperating with the, our efforts to provide uh, information. And here we have uh, um, WMO and WHO also, uh, ICAO, uh, IMO, International Maritime Organization. All these in, uh, organizations have made their uh, assessments and uh, uh, have commented uh, on the advice uh, that pu the public or pub other public authorities should make. Uh, our immediate priority for the time being is, as I said, to bring the situation under control as soon as possible. Uh, and as a next step, uh, we will have to thoroughly examine the inc this incident uh, the cause of the accidents and uh, what was uh, missing or, or lacking or not uh, enough in, in terms of uh, security standards, etc. And we intend to full, fully share our experience and analysis with the international uh, community and uh, uh, in order to contribute to the discussion for a better safety standard. And we recognize that the June IAEA ministerial conference that was, has been mentioned will be uh, a crucial uh, occasion for that. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your statement, Mr. Ambassador. I would like now to give the floor to Ambassador Tibor Toth, who will provide uh, views on behalf of the, uh, his organization. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Special Representative and Mr. Director. Uh, my presence is, uh, here is not trivial. I'm representing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, so you might ask the question, what is the relationship? And I would like to make three points. And the message is that your community and other communities will have to look over the horizon. Systems, there are systems over the horizon which are relevant. There are values which, is, which are over the horizon which are relevant. And there is action which is over the horizon action which will have to be undertaken. L let me start with the first point. It's about the, the system. The organization I am representing is to prevent a different disaster. It is to prevent the disaster. Nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon test might lead to. At the same time, for monitoring the silence of nuclear weapon tests, a system has been created. And uh, you might see behind me nearly 400 monitoring stations. What you don't see, 250 communication assets. These are Facilities listening to the earth, seismic stations, listening to the oceans, hydroacoustic stations, listening to the atmosphere, infrasound stations, and we have a sniffing technology, the so-called radionuclide nuclear gas sniffing technology. All these technologies enable us to pick up the noises of natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcano eruptions. This system enables us to pick up unnecessary noises of man-made disasters. And here, the Fukushima incident is one reminder of the man-made disasters. This system is supported by forecast called atmospheric transport modeling, which could be absolutely relevant be it for nuclear accidents or the release of dangerous forces as a result of other man-made disasters. Director Kalikov mentioned three aspects of the 11th of March disaster, the earthquake, the tsunami, and the nuclear contingency. And he mentioned which are the common features. There's one more common feature. These three emergencies ticked off all the boxes 
this system can support. Earthquake monitoring, tsunami monitoring, and radionuclide release monitoring. My second point beyond uh, the over-the-horizon look for system is over-the-horizon values. <coughs> values which are not necessarily the trivial values. And I would like to mention two of them. One is the information and the knowledge, the first one. On tsunami warning, the, the system which you see uh, behind me provided with 20 seismic and hydroacoustic systems early warning data for the, for the Japanese uh, authorities responsible for the tsunami warning. Altogether, we have 200 stations which can potentially globally, uh, with the fastest speed, with the highest reliability, and with the highest quality support tsunami early warning. Another aspect of information and, and knowledge is the radionuclide technology and the radionuclide monitoring. Here, my colleague might put on the screen something which probably is encapsulating what I would like to make as a point. I don't want to explain this slide. This is about measuring with global radionuclide monitoring stations the dispersion of low level of radionuclides as a function of time and how the different radionuclides are, are picked up. The point I would like to make, and uh, I do not want to be lost in this slide, is the following. Around 80 radionuclide isotopes or Norberger's isotopes can be monitored with, with this system at a low level which means positive measurement is possible. It's not the absence of measurement. Positive measurement, hopefully low level. Ratios of radionuclides can be identified, which is extremely important for nuclear accidents. Compared to background information and historical pattern of the presence of these radionuclides, in a way that it's a one-stop shopping. So we pull together atmospheric transport modeling, forecast of dispersion, and the measurement in a seamless one-stop shopping manner. On the value added, the second point I would like to make is about transparency. There is a strong element of transparency of this system. Why? Number one, this is a non-national system. It's leveraging all the potential shortcomings of a national system. There is global data gathering. It's extremely important that all who are beneficiaries of this information know where this data is coming from, how the equipment is measuring the, the releases, how the data is being processed, and how the information is being distributed. And this is all in an extremely transparent manner. Last point, over the horizon action. And because of the lack of time, I would like to focus on, on two aspects. When I say over the horizon action, uh, of course, sometimes it's not easy to say what will happen tomorrow in, in a situation like that. But we have to look beyond tomorrow. We have to look beyond the next three to six months, though important action is being undertaken. Probably we have to focus parallelly with the short-term approach to focus on the next 10, 20 years and, this, and to see what are the emerging systems and emerging values and what is their application. Just referring to this system, this system was non-existent 10 years ago. As a result of an investment of uh, around $1 billion and, and 1,000 person years uh, dedicated support, this is a reality by now. We have to look beyond the horizon, over the horizon, what are the global monitoring assets of the future to address the challenges of the future. We have to probably undertake something, and that was a recommendation from myself to the UN Secretary General, a technology foresight about global monitoring system. It's a, it's a discrete discipline. It's a multi-stakeholder approach. From that point of view, I would like to extend to you an invitation to, to a conference which will be held in Vienna, June, early June this year, 
1,000 scientists will come together and uh, explore monitoring technologies and the intersection of technology foresight and application for civil and scientific application of the assets we have. The second over the horizon action beyond technology foresight is education. It's over the horizon because the benefits will be reaped not in the next uh, three to six months. And here I would like to flag that we would like to launch a, a monitoring technology distance education effort. With the trendy word, it's multi-stakeholder. We would like to involve international organizations, education institutions, universities, research entities, the industry, and individuals, individuals like you as well. So please follow our website. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Now I give the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Love from uh, World Meteorological Organization to hear perspective of that organization of extreme weather conditions. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Director Kalvikop. Um, and, and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon now. I guess uh, the WMO's role in all of this was in, in some way foreshadowed by the previous uh, presentation. The WMO in 1986, 25 years ago, had the uh, foresight after the Chernobyl incident to put in place a global system for tracking and monitoring the dispersion of uh, anything in the atmosphere, really, because in a sense, the WMO community has developed uh, a set of global forecast models that uh, are very high resolution. And so whether it's a, a, a volcanic ash cloud, whether it's smoke from a major industrial fire, uh, a radioactive cloud, whatever, providing we have the source term for that event, then it is possible to model with quite some accuracy where that cloud will move. Um, and also in the terms of a radioactive cloud, the uh, washout from rain events as well as the fallout if we know that. And so that, that system was put in place in 1986 and has worked very effectively ever since. It gets tested yearly. And we're pleased to say that in this emergency uh, in recent times, the eight centres that work, uh, and those centres are Beijing in China, Obninsk in the Russian Federation, Tokyo in Japan, Exeter in the United Kingdom, Toulouse in France, Melbourne in Australia, Montreal in Canada, and Washington in the USA, all moved into action within minutes of being advised of the event, and in fact have continued to provide uh, information through a plan coordinated by the IAEA um, that, that works through focal points in the various countries and I think has helped uh, many, many decision makers have an understanding of the event that they faced. Um, I guess when we look at the event, uh, as with any real event, we can look back and say in, in a testing sense what, what went well, what didn't go well, and how we can improve. And certainly we've done that. Um, and, and I don't think this is a technical meeting, as the ambassador to my left said. It's, it's more to take, take stock of the big picture. Um, we, we believe that risk assessment for the siting of these facilities is probably an area that we need to think more about particularly from our own perspective as, as experts on a range of meteorological hazards, how those might affect siting, uh, ongoing monitoring. Ambassador Toth mentioned the, the need for exchange of information. Uh, all the forecast models that we have are only as good as the source terms. They're also only as good as uh, the way they parameterise such things as washout processes. They're also only as good as how well they predict the atmosphere, and that essentially relies on the uh, 10,000 monitoring stations that the WMO coordinates around the world and freely exchanges the data and has done so for the last 50 or 60 years. 
So there, there are many, many players to make such a system work and, and I guess those all need examining as we move forward. Um, but emergency planning all requires testing of, of what we have in place. And I think the previous session talked about scenarios, run, building scenarios and simulations, but I think simulation can be interpreted in many ways. I think simulation means actual testing of the standard procedures we're putting in place to be sure that they work. And, and we heard from the uh, delegate from Sweden saying that it took them a year to prepare for a test. And I think that preparing for tests is very important. It brings together people and you have the dialogue, um, exchanging the information about what works and what doesn't work after the test is also important. So those are the, the sorts of things the WMO brings to the table. We are a technical agency and we work by coordinating the efforts of the, the 189 national meteorological and hydrological services that play a part in this. And we know it's a small part, but we think it's an important part. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Love, thank you very much for sharing your perspective and insights. Uh, dear participants, let us now listen to Elena Buglova, Acting Centre Head, Incidents of, uh, and Emergency Centre from International Atomic Energy Agency. You have the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to briefly describe to you the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency in preparedness and response to nuclear emergencies. The activities of the IAEA are based on the relevant conventions and lessons learned from response to past nuclear emergencies. Accidents at nuclear power plants in Three Mile Island and Chernobyl have shown to the international community that severe emergencies, even of low probability, need to be addressed in emergency plans. And such emergencies may warrant immediate protective actions with regard to protection of emergency workers and the public. Other lessons which were learned from response to these emergencies were related to international coordination, assistance, cooperation, need to um, deal with possible transboundary releases, need to address immediate and demands media attention, and requirements to make prompt decisions based on comprehensive set of criteria developed and set in advance. Let me give you a few examples on IA activities with regard to these lessons. Soon after Chernobyl accident, two conventions, Convention on Early Notification of a Nuclear Accident and Convention on Assistance in Case of Nuclear Accident and Radiological Emergency were developed and entered into force. These conventions form a basis for international notification and assistance system. The integrated response international system of the IEA with IEA in Incident and Emergency Center, or IEC, at its heart um, is in place. And actually, it has been in place since 2005. The Incident and Emergency Center has uh, a comprehensive set of safety standards, operational guidance, and training materials which cover all areas of preparedness and response to nuclear emergencies. And the IEC plays an important role in strengthening preparedness for response at national, regional, and international levels. IEC assists member states to implement guidance with the help of training courses, workshops, exercises, and also with the missions, which could be tailored to the needs of a specific state. International exercises, which are called CONVEX-3, it's full-scale international exercise, they're organized on a regular basis and uh, involved states and international organizations are testing their preparedness and response capabilities and arrangements on how to deal with nuclear, specifically nuclear emergencies. In addition, there is a peer review service of the IEA in the area of emergency preparedness and response, which is called EPREF, Emergency Preparedness Review, uh, which is based on safety standards and involves deployment of international team of experts, which allow independent appraisal of national capabilities for emergency preparedness and response. 
One of the important functions of the IEA in response to nuclear emergency is provision of public uh, information. And uh, there is a system in place which allows to provide information to states and international organizations uh, on the 24-7 basis. The information is provided using faxes and also password protected uh, website system, which is called ANAC, Emergency Notification Assistance Convention website. Uh, given the mandate of the IEA in the nuclear field, the IEC of the agency serves as a coordinating body in so-called Interagency Committee on Radiological and Nuclear Emergencies, one of the main tasks of which is development and maintenance of the Joint Radiation Emergency Plan of international organizations. I am proud to say that the current version of the uh, plan is uh, developed and co-sponsored by 13 international organizations in cooperation with other two international organizations. In response to Fukushima accident, the agency has been working in full stretch, uh, utilizing existing arrangements and capabilities. The uh, IEC Incident and Emergency Center was activated and uh, was working in a full response mode around the clock. Uh, we activated immediately the joint plan I have referred to, and uh, immediately after the accident, uh, staff members from WHO and FAO joined the center to support international uh, activities. In addition, an uh, expert from Austrian Meteorological Center was working in the IEC under the bilateral agreement between IEA and WMO. And we were working together with, uh, um, with the CTBTO, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, on developing the input for meteorological products. Agencies' activities in response to Fukushima event included um, channeling the information to member states using the mechanism I already described, uh, dispatching IEA teams of experts in different areas to Japan, and providing Japan uh, the information about assistance offers which IEA got from the member states. I would like to conclude saying that clear role, central mandate, extensive membership and comprehensive technical expertise, which is gathered by the IEA in the last uh, 50 years, put the IEA as a hub where the further discussion on the way forward should take place. Message safety first is an IA message which is used by member states when they are assessing the existing nuclear power plant, developing or building future nuclear facilities. This is a message which should underpin all of our activities. And the ministerial conference on nuclear safety, which will take place in June in Vienna, 20 to 24th of June, will uh, discuss further strengthening of emergency preparedness and response area in addition to a preliminary assessment of Fukushima accident and general review of nuclear safety. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention. And now I give the floor uh, to a representative of the World Health Organization. Dr. Nier, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Let me give you, if still needed, an additional reason why we need to strengthen our preparedness on nuclear incident. And the reason is health and well-being. I'm sure there is no for discussion here. While uh, Japan was dealing from day one with the technological challenges posed by the uh, nuclear incident, everybody started to think about the potential public health consequences and how this will be affecting the health of the people, their well-being, and even as the Japanese ambassador was saying, how this will cause anxiety, social disruption, human suffering, and the consequences and, and the mental health terms that we all know. This is, uh, for WHO, again, the first lesson that we learned, that health has to be very much at the core of any decision related to uh, energy policies that the governments are taking. Health impact assessment has to be very much at front when taking decisions. Immediately from day one, WHO started to look at how to collect information to do proper, accurate, and the most possible independent 
health risk assessment. And in that sense, it proved to be extremely useful, the network that has been created with all the relevant UN agencies and IAEA, the joint plan, and collecting information that was extremely useful in order to do our health risk assessment and being able to respond to the uh, important massive demand by the community, the international community, and obviously nationals in Japan about how this will affect their health. WHO has been learning as well that the work that has been done in preparation for that, having a very strong program on radiation and health, all the knowledge that we have been collecting for many years now, for 25 years on the public health consequences of Chernobyl, all the epidemiological studies that have been done were extremely useful to be able now to assess what the potential health consequences will be. I think having the basic safety standards in place, all the networks operating, the REMP and a group of experts that by coincidence and ironically, they were meeting 15 days before in Nagasaki in preparation for an event that hopefully was occurring only every 25 years. Unfortunately, it happened again, but that proves the importance of one, collecting information in advance and being able to have a very strong network of information that will give you the data that you need to do health risk assessment. Second, having these very operational networks and being able to operate then on a very short notice. And third, having the capacity to communicate on the potential, on the most uh, uh, frequent asked quest ask questions related to health will give us a very strong uh, uh, capacity to respond and to even sometimes avoid unnecessary measures that will add to the disruption already created there. So we would like to uh, uh, insist on the importance of having a strong program on radiation and health, bringing health very much at the core of your government decisions when you select the source of energy that you will have, and of course, strengthening the importance of preparedness and response and having mechanisms and networks that will ensure that we will have the capacity to respond and avoid as much as possible the health suffering, the health consequences that can be even prolonged very much on the time. So I will keep on that lessons on the health aspects, hoping that will be very much at the center of your agenda for the next years. Thank you very much. Statement, I give the floor now to Margareta. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Rashid. Um, we are reaching rapidly the end of this session, but let me um, just say that there was no accident when technological disasters were introduced in the yoga framework for action. Um, uh, and this is an opportunity, regrettably on the back of a very tragic incident, to actually do what we had for the past 15 years needed to do. So let me just summarize. I think there are, uh, we have mostly spoken here about how to respond to crisis. What I would really like us to think about is how do we actually improve safety in the investments that we are making? Many of you participated in the session this morning when we discussed the, the accumulation of global risk. And of course, this is another area of global risk accumulation. And you will remember the, the, the concept of synchronic and sequential disasters. And of course, tragically, Japan was the latest, but for sure not the last, because our societies are getting so complex, so sophisticated, and there are such huge investment in complex infrastructure, so our, our vulnerability is increasing in spite of us getting richer and smarter, I would say, overall. Uh, so when we look at um, where the gaps in our system is, uh, the, the first gap is really an all-of-society approach to safety and resilience. And I think, Rashid, you mentioned in your first point that one of the evolutions that have gone very quickly is the, um, the very rapid development of singular, highly specialized response systems. Um, and clearly, that is not the way of managing public fear, uh, because public fear, particularly in the case of nuclear disasters, and no other country but Japan 
that fear would be higher, I would think, given your historical uh, uh, experiences. Uh, and managing fear is how do we respond to that otherwise through education, through making knowledge easily available, through integration of systems, and particularly in a crisis management situation. Um, and I, I can see it's not only Japan, but today any government, any organization, no matter how knowledgeable, has a real problem in sort of controlling the story. Uh, you know how every government is second guessed uh, when it happens, any disaster, everyone has access to information that seem to refute or support. Uh, so I think the, 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 the perspective that we need to take uh, on uh, not only the accidents caused by uh, a failure in a nuclear plant, but this morning I had a conversation about this topic and one of the participants said, well, I'm living in a region where we have a huge hydroelectric dam in the confluence of river systems. And what my population really fears is that this dam will collapse on them and destroy their environment, their livelihoods, and basically their lives and have them move away. Uh, so when we move ahead, I think um, there is, of course, a lot that is highly specialized for nuclear energy. You need specialists to respond, but you, don't, you have to have an all of society approach to crisis management the transparency that you offered amb ambassador. When we looked at your system, we say, we are spending a lot of time saying we are not, should we, uh, how do we ab avoid building parallel and duplicative systems? I don't know if your invitation, if your presentation was an invitation to build less duplicative systems that can be useful for all of society. But I would hope that this is the beginning of, of that kind of engagement. Um, I don't think we can treat this choice lightly. Um, countries have to make decisions about sources of energy for economic growth. Uh, and in order not to over-rationalize the potential of a choices between one source of energy and the other, that's why I really think we have to look at how to improve safety overall in society, how to build um, uh, resilience and safety frameworks in countries which integrate all crisis management systems and all disaster response system so that the disaster response experts don't um, feel excluded and helpless when uh, things uh, like Japan happen. It's also important, we've heard risk assessment mentioned many times here, risk assessment needs to be very location specific. Uh, and that's, of course, a lesson that we've heard over the past years. Countries are interested in global risk perspective, but they say, I need to know what the risk is in my part of the world, in my country, in my part of the country. So the expertise in risk assessment is something that needs to really uh, be proliferated uh, very quickly. And finally, um, the point I'd just like to mention is that the, the, the public private partnership. Of course, a lot of the very uh, risk prone, not necessarily they are designed to be risk prone, but over a period of time become risk prone because changes in the external environment facilities are managed by <coughs> private and corporate sector entities. So no approach in this area can be done without uh, really involving fully the private sector, both as owners and managers of facilities uh, that are really crucial and essential to societies. So, um, uh, Rashid, I hope this is um, just the beginning of a discussion on how we try to tear down some of the barriers between the communities that I think also Ambassador taught you. You asked us to look over the horizon. Let, let's look over the horizon together. Um, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your statement, uh, and um, um, I would like to remind you that we have this um, session planned until 1.15. We can go a little bit longer than that if uh, there is uh, uh, a need to do so. So the floor is open for interventions, comments, questions, and please introduce yourself. You have the floor, sir.
Okay, my name is Max Wies. I'm a seismic expert. I have served as an expert in a $600 million suit in California because the nuclear power plant at uh, Diablo Canyon was not built adequately for the seismic hazard that was to be expected. It was found out by the US Geological Survey who then forced the owners to retrofit the plant to withstand three times more a stronger shaking, ground shaking, than before. And that cost $600 million, but luckily it was discovered. So in Japan, it is known that there have been 22 tsunamis with heights larger than 10 meters. This nuclear power plant was not prepared to deal with an even smaller wave. How is this possible? I think we should review all nuclear power plants for their, uh, how well they're built to withstand the, the earthquakes and tsunamis that reasonably have to be expected. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You have the floor. Okay, uh, I am Jalal Dabik from Palestine, uh, expert uh, on disaster uh, management and earthquake engineering. Uh, from scientific point of view, not from political point of view, uh, I, uh, I'm taking in, uh, feedback from what happened in the world, especially in Japan and other countries, uh, based on disaster risk reduction concept, as scientists know, and the element of disaster risk reduction, uh, hazard, vulnerability and the capacity. Uh, in our region, uh, a nuclear uh, reactor was built near or very close to very active faults in the region, in the Dead Sea Transform Fault, and is very known for the scientists in the world. First, I want to ask, when it was built uh, before 50 years, uh, the area was considered, according to, to the, the scientist uh, maps and hazard map, that no active area or no, no seismic area. In 1985 and after that, uh, uh, we cons uh, they consider it as active seismic area. Now, second, according, based on the vulnerability of this nuclear uh, building, uh, it's how, what about its vulnerability? How we can reduce its vulnerability according to our disaster risk reduction global? This is the question. Th uh, second, the country in the area uh, have not control in the reactor ha and their capacity in preparedness and the, in prepare uh, their capacity and preparedness are very weak. The question is, how we can increase their coping capacities to face if something happened in the world, in this area? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, on a very similar subject, uh, in Lebanon, we have a project being managed by the IAEA and funded by the EU on uh, developing a national response plan for CBRN events. One of the scenarios that we are considering is an explosion in the Daimona reactor, whether due to an earthquake or an industrial mishap or whatever. Um, and uh, we are a bit uh, concerned because A, the reactor is not monitored by the IAEA on the one hand, and on the other hand, because the main lesson that we understand coming out of Japan is the importance of transparency and early warning systems. Bearing, I mean, taking into account the lack of transparency and early warning systems that will not be available to us, and the adverse, any adverse wind directions and speeds, then we are looking at catastrophic scenarios. So my question is, I mean, what is being done, if I may ask, by the international community to ensure that international law is being uh, applied without exception, especially bearing into account that with the right wind speeds and conditions, such a cloud might travel not to Lebanon or Arab countries, through the Mediterranean and to Europe beyond it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Any other requests for the floor? Yes. So my name is Adam Konyshevsky and I represent Green Cross International. 
Our organizations have been working for 15 years in the Chernobyl affected areas. And so we have first-hand experience on dealing with the interconnected and long-term environmental, social, medical, and psychological consequences of the disaster. In fact, we've just completed a study and issued a report on the psychological consequences, and that is available for distribution if anyone's interested. Since the Fukushima disaster has demonstrated once again that nuclear safety seems to be a contradiction in terms. Uh, my question is, with 400 nuclear plants still out there and more disasters likely to happen, how can civil society contribute to the disaster risk reduction process? Um, thank you very much. Um, any other requests for the floor? Yes, you have the floor. Uh, my question to Dr. Nira, uh, regarding the lesson that was uh, taken from Chernobyl and that information you have used it in Japan. Can you give us an example of, a couple of examples briefly? Uh, thank you very much. You have the floor, sir. Yes, uh, Gerardo Huertas from WSPA. Any information about the impact and the uh, rehabilitation of uh, agriculture and livestock in Fukushima? Uh, thank you very much. With this, I have to, to close the floor for questions and comments. And why don't we ask uh, members of the panel just from the left, uh, Dr. Nair, you have the floor, and then continue to the right. Please. Okay, in the first round, we finish with I, health. I just have to now. remind that you have a very small period of time. You are taking my time now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, very, very short then. One of the lessons are how low doses are affecting the health of the people, medium doses, and then related particularly to uh, uh, incidents of uh, thyroid cancer, other type of cancers like leukemia, and much of the uh, social and uh, mental health consequences that, that were described before. I think one of the most comprehensive reviews, not only by WHO, but many other groups that have been done on epidemiological studies looking at the health consequences after 25 years of Chernobyl. So it's, it's, it's a retrospective one uh, looking at the health uh, impact that uh, the reports are ready. I can share it with you in, to save time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Ms. Buglow, you have the floor. Trying to shortly answer the wide variety of questions. Uh, regarding monitoring system and uh, the need to have the information on a global level, I can tell you that the IEA is in the process of developing global monitoring system, combining together the networks which are already available in different regions. Uh, for the information uh, regarding Fukushima, and not only uh, referring to the specific questions which was asked, I would like again to, to tell you that the IEA was putting regularly the information through different channels. One is to the competent authorities in your respective countries, for those states which are here, uh, tw two times per day and then one, once per day, depending on the situation. Uh, with a comprehensive review. In addition, on the IEA website available to the public, it was always a summary of the information. So I would like to invite you to visit this website and uh, IEA public website and to find the information on Fukushima there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Brachikov, you have the floor. Спасибо, господин председатель. Много вопросов было направлено на озабоченность нахождением тех или иных радиационно опасных объектов на своей территории. И я бы хотел сказать, что это, конечно, тот вопрос, за который отвечают, отвечают службы гражданской защиты во многом, с тем, чтобы защитить и население, и территории, если инцидент произойдет. Объекты такие есть практически у всех, а трансграничные риски вообще говорят, конечно, о глобальной определенной опасности, но суть в том, чтобы обеспечить безопасное развитие этих объектов, безопасное функционирование и минимизировать все возможные риски, особенно тогда, когда инцидент уже, вот, как говорится, у нас в руках. Поэтому мы говорим о дополнении всех тех мер совершенствованием реагирования на подобные чрезвычайные ситуации на объектах ядерно-топливного цикла, 
и, конечно, говорим о том, чтобы применялись более эффективно конвенции, конвенции прежде всего об ущербе, о ядерной, об ядерном и радиационном ущербе. Спасибо. Thank you very much, Mr. Brazhnikov. Ambassador Tolik has the floor. Uh, addressing the question of, of Green Cross, uh, there is an issue what, what can be done. And uh, my feeling is that we have to think about where future might lead us. The pre-Fukushima projection was that nuclear energy might increase in between 30 to 100 percent in the next 20 years. It might double up to 2000, uh, 2050. All that we will bring about, if it happens, a uh, corresponding increase of, of facilities, of uh, fissile materials, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, technology, uh, people who are dealing with all these technologies. There is an important issue, how far we are ready for that. Are we preparing for the last contingency with the tools of yesterday or not? And my feeling is that we, we need, uh, first of all, an approach where we move out of our boxes. That was my message. Look over the horizon. Uh, there are these communities like um, disaster risk reduction community. There is a uh, safety community. There is a security community. There is a community where I'm coming from to take care of proliferation resistant uh, technologies in a, in a wider sense. We have to work together. And some of the challenges look like a tsunami, which might be 10 meters high. So we have to create a wall of safety, security, proliferation resistance, which is corresponding to the challenge ahead of us. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Director General, you have the floor. Michel? Monsieur Michel? Yeah, no, okay, Mr. Ambassador. Okay, uh, about the tsunami, uh, all the nuclear facilities withstand the uh, earthquake, but uh, clearly the tsunami uh, protection was not sufficient. Uh, the existing regulation has taken the data uh, back to, to about 100 years, but uh, we have uh, uh, the record of uh, a similar type of tsunami in 869, and uh, this time it was... Uh, uh, more than 30 meters. So clearly we need to uh, look into the uh, regulation and we will share the uh, result with the international community when, once we, we have uh, completed the uh, review. Uh, for the moment, the government is requesting the an, an, another nuclear facility uh, in the south of Tokyo, which is called Hamaoka, to suspend its operation until proper protection against tsunami is, is uh, being built. Um, on the uh, agriculture and livestock uh, issues, um, th th there is uh, two issues. Um, within the 30 kilometers perimeter that uh, we are requesting people to, to evacuate, um, of course the, any agricultural activity or is, is uh, prohibited. Um, beyond that, uh, certain terrain has uh, still some residual uh, particles and so uh, we are trying to remove the, the dust and uh, change the soil. But the uh, contamination is not only for radioactive materials. Of course, there's uh, tsunami salt water which has emerged with, with the land. So there's an extensive um, uh, exercise to uh, uh, rebuild the agricultural terrain. Uh, and uh, this, this has a varying pro progress. So this is the situation. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Mr. Love, you have the floor. Thank you, Rashid. Just, just very briefly, uh, after every disaster, there is a window opens when you can make changes. There are resources available. There's an awareness, a will, and the lessons are learned. I think Ambassador Toth says it might be a 10 metre tsunami coming down on us of changes we have to make, but we have to move relatively quickly before the lessons are lost, some other disaster occupies the scene. And so now is the time, I think, 
to consolidate, to learn and to try and move forward uh, with, with our experiences from this event. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Margaret, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Rashid. I, I'd also like to echo Ambassador Todd's uh, um, message here, which is well known to all the disaster practitioners, that we tend to design the future on the basis of uh, yesterday's emergency and be not very well prepared for tomorrow's. Uh, so I think my, uh, my call to you is don't leave this session uh, and leave the topic behind. Remain engaged, take the invitation to go to Vienna, uh, only if we see it also as our responsibility to, to break down the barriers between different systems in society that we built around us for the past 60 years, will we be able to tackle these kinds of things and the fairly significant challenge that you paint out for us in terms of where we go on safety issues. But it is, as you have heard here, there is also sometimes a mix of safety and security perspectives. And I think only by remaining fully engaged will we be able to reduce uh, some of the uh, issues that are safety and treat security a little bit separately, at least more explicitly, so that we know how to act as a society. Uh, so that will be my final call, remain engaged. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, you summarized the discussion already. Just maybe two or three uh, things that I, I, I guess we have to um, take from this discussion. One is, if I may quote you again, uh, Mr. Ambassador, look uh, over the horizon. A lot of international organizations and national governments are doing a lot of things, but they have not been ensured that they are complementary, that they're mutually supportive, and they address the, uh, the aim that is to be to make sure uh, that there will be uh, risk proper assessed and all the safeguards that need to be taken will be taken care of in case of nuclear or other technological breakdowns. The second issue I think we, uh, we can take from here is that there is a strong link between uh, the natural disasters and possible technological breakdowns and we have to look into that when we identify sites and we, uh, when we look into the possibility of establishing nuclear plant or industrial uh, enterprise that will be of that scope that may have an impact on lives and livelihoods of the population around it. Uh, the third thing, I, I guess, and uh, Margaret, I fully support you on that one, that one has not to be complacent. What happened recently and what happened in recent years, just uh, a reminder not only of responsibility, but also open an opportunity to do something for this uh, effort. And then um, maybe quickly say what um, various members of the panel interventions from the floor identified as things that we have to look into, that is including the strengthening of safeguards, enhanced industrial facilities, e wider exchange of information and equipment, uh, sharing um, the best practices, and also what is very important is training of the population that is living around the uh, various industrial plants and also population and governments that are taking care of that. And what is extremely important is that we have to strengthen early warning systems. We have now various early warning systems that are functioning in uh, national and global and regional level, but they are not connected and uh, uh, very often extreme weather conditions that may create a risk or danger to uh, industrial breakdown really do not take care of seriously. I would like to thank all of you for attending this roundtable discussion and hope that we produced enough material for you, Margareta, to take over at the discussion with the Secretary General. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.